Now, you're welcome along to The Football Show. So, as you know, I do plenty of interviews with sports people about their new books. Generally, people I don't speak to that often or have much of a relationship with. So this one feels a little bit strange. I'm holding up Pat Nevin's new book. So for the last eight years or so that I've been in this chair, we've talked pretty much every Monday across the football season. And then before that, he was on commentaries on weekend shows that I worked on behind the scenes. And so I assure you, listeners, it is one of the great perks of the job. Never sensationalist, always nuanced, such a great feel for the game and players and brings great insight and humor. And we have covered our fair share of topics over the years. Incidentally, Pat never wants to know what's coming up in advance of our conversations. <laughs> Not that you can tell, to be fair, by his very thoughtful answers. And the chat often goes into interesting places, which probably keeps us both uh, sane and interested. But now, now, it's time to cover Pat Nevin in some depth. He has released a new book, Pat Nevin, The Accidental Footballer, a memoir. Pat Nevin, hello. Uh, hello, and it's kind of nice to speak to you uh, in a slightly <laughs> different way. Um, I know. It's been a bit mad recently, and uh, I, I come to you here from my, not my usual place, I'm in my brother's house, and because uh, I'm rushing between two or three different jobs, um, but I've been kind of, I, I gave you that copy, I sent you that copy a long time ago, um, but you've been, you've been kind enough to hold on a while, uh, you were one of the first people to actually get sent it. Well, you sent me a note at the time. I felt guilty because I just didn't have time. We're always getting stuff in to read. You said, I hope you can get to this and get, get time to read this. I'd love to hear your thoughts. I, belatedly, my thoughts are, I love this. I thought this was just great. Congratulations. Not easy to write a book and to do it yourself. And you have pulled it off with aplomb. How easy, difficult was the whole process? Uh, I loved it. <laughs> I absolutely loved it from start to finish. Now, I've got a little bit of previous in the fact that I've been writing for newspapers for about 25 years anyway. So... Hopefully I can string the odd sentence together, um, but it's different. You know, it's different when you're writing uh, not for a newspaper because it's, it's a different type of skill, different thing to write. And I put it off for such a long time. Um, but you see how easy it was. It absolutely flowed out. I, I could not stop. And I completely got addicted to uh, writing it. Um, and when it's like that, um, I think it comes across as hopefully fun and easy to read. Um, mm. So and then the other thing is because I wrote every word of it, if it is rubbish, I need to put my hands up and say that was me. That was my fault. <laughs> but I hope it's uh, entertaining, a uh, bit informative. Um, but I, I mean, a lot of fun is hopefully as well. And now, oh, a lot of fun, a lot of fun. Did you get emotional writing about your past and the people in your past? That's a brilliant question. Um, I I did once or twice because, yeah. and this is the oddness of it, you don't generally look back much because um, in football many things, but particularly foot sport, you have to look ahead. Looking back, you're almost admitting failure. You need to go ahead, go ahead. So my whole, through my entire career, I never looked back. And then when I finished, I ended up doing a lot of media stuff and other things. And I thought, well, I'll not look back yet. So in the end, it was decades. And I finally thought, right, I'm going to look back now. And I mean, certainly a lot of the stuff at the start, talking about my dad, who's no longer with us, uh, was really quite emotional to write. Um, yeah. And it was a joy to write it as well. There was other moments, I have to say, I did, I did tear up when I was writing about the things that happened at Hillsborough because I wouldn't write that in, a, in any way flippant. That that was important and serious, you know, what we were going through and what you felt at the time. And I suppose that's what you're trying to do. You, you're trying to let people see where, what it felt like inside. The is an unusual one that you've probably read sports books from look, an, ins an insider's inside view, but I'm an outsider inside. So I'm kind of like all the rest of us thrown into this world and then seeing the strangeness and the weirdness and the different attitudes they've got, which is summed up slightly pithily by you know, when I went to Chelsea, they all called me weirdo and me thinking, no, no, I'm normal. You lot are weird. And completely and utterly believing that sentence. Yeah. Um, and it's, I hope it's an insight as, as well as anything else, the kind of weirdness of it. Huge insight. I'm so glad you mentioned, I'm, I'm not surprised to um, hear you say that about your father. And I'm so glad you mentioned that first, because for me, and this is unusual, I think, in the many, many sports biographies I've read, where by definition, the, the really interesting part of someone's life takes hold later on when they become a sports person or do whatever they do. For me, I thought the richest, most vivid part of the book and the part that stayed with me, I finished it a few days ago. The part that I remember most vividly is about your family. Mm -hmm. I thought it was just beautiful. So we might talk about that a little bit. Uh, Glasgow, Easter House, uh, Tenement, mm -hmm. up three flights of stairs. 
Can I just give people, because we'll get on to your father, and we've talked about your father a few times in the show. Yeah. So Mary, your mother, just to give people a sense of, I guess, somebody, you know, living a hard but beautiful life in many ways. Breakfast for all six kids, the Nevin kids. Mm-hmm. Took care of her own mother who had dementia. Went to mass. She would help clean the priest's house and the church. She would do the flowers at the church. She would come back to the house. She would do the shopping and lug that up the three flights of stairs. She would do the washing. The kids would get home from school. The madness would begin all on a budget, all with probably very little time to herself. Obviously an amazing person. Yeah, and sticking top of that, that my dad was a coach of many teams. So my, my mom did the washing of yeah. all the strips of all the teams. And not just one team, it was two, three, four teams sometimes. And all those strips would be out in the washing line out the back of the tenements uh, getting cleaned. And how she did it, it was un- unthinkable, un- beyond me how you actually managed to do all that stuff. She was, she was an angel in this world. Uh, mm-hmm. Never ever seemed to have any thought for herself. Um, I can very rarely, you know, can think of things that were involved in her. It was always what she could do for her family and herself. And there is a generation that was quite like that. Um, and my mum's, you know, you know, our family are Irish and we come from a different background. So there's lots of people listening to a certain age will go, yeah, that was my mum, that was my yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and, and it is, and I wanted to say that in, in an age where everybody's, it's about me and what I want to do and how I have to self-actualize myself. Yes. To, to grow up with parents who never actually mentioned the me word at any point and not through some big sacrifice, it's just who they were. And I, I wanted to underline that uh, to people that people you can be like that it's, and it's a beautiful life to be that. I mean, had my mum been a nun, it wouldn't have been a surprise because she'd have given her life to someone else because that was what she was all about. Um, there was one, there was lots of bits I didn't put in the book and I'll tell you wee bits that aren't in it. Like, I can remember walking in one day, my mum was like dancing at the tea dances, all that sort of stuff. And so was my dad did that later in his life as well. I remember walking out of the house one day in the early 80s, my mum was dancing around the kitchen and it was a new single by the Smiths. <laughs> and some devil. And I'm thinking, my mum's dancing, like <laughs> making the dinner with the, the ribs going in the background. And like, and it was it was such a beautiful thing we had together. And of course, she was scared to death of me becoming a footballer because I had to get a sensible job like everybody else, but to do the education, which again is another thing where you, you can't be a football player. That's a silly thing to do. Um, and it took many, many years to accept it. And there's a great line, and I hope you agreed. I was talking to her when I agreed to go to Chelsea and she didn't want me to go. And it wasn't because of the football, because I was going to live in that, not London, but that den of iniquity. And it's such a classic line. Uh, so, you know, it's lovely to be actually able to do that. But it isn't just my mum. It's There's a lot of people out there think, ah, yeah, that's what my mum did for me, you know, and my parents did for me. Yes. It's almost a selflessness I can't relate to. Like, there's such a beauty. You said it's a beautiful life. And I totally agree with that. Like, it is a beautiful mm-hmm. life. And I don't suspect she was looking around at her lot thinking, mm-hmm. oh, is this all there is? I, I, it was it was almost immersed in it, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if you are immersed in that, and it's, yes, it was very Catholic, but it was very Christian outlook. And the Christian outlook was, you know, to do what you can for your fellow man, fellow mm-hmm. woman, you know, mm-hmm. and that was important above anything else. And that made her very happy um, to be able to do that. Um, so in a way, whatever it is, it makes you happy. And if it's given to other people, I mean, I suppose as you get older, I think you get to realize that actually giving presents is better than getting them. I mean, it's, I mean and a lot of people understand that as they get mm. older. Mm. And uh, my parents were, were, were both like that. Um, and to be honest, I, I could have written so, in fact, I did write a lot more about my mom and dad, but I thought, actually, we need to get into the story. No, <laughs> I get that. Point. I get that. And, and Patrick Sr. then, so I had heard, you know, we, we have talked about you doing your Maisie dribble to say hello to him because he would mm-hmm. trek down to matches far and wide. So I hadn't realized the British Rail kind of 6.30 a.m. start by 5.30 p.m. He would be coaching you or coaching various teams. Yeah. And we've talked before about how he'd read various coaching manuals or he'd mm-hmm. borrow from Jock Steen up the road, yeah. uh, which is an amazing thing. I hadn't realized this, that, and who knows where your social conscience comes from. But your dad, Catholic, diligent, smart, 40 years with British Rail, wasn't really, it seems, the done thing for Catholics to get promoted. So he was he was never promoted in all those years, but never bitter about it, which is a testament to him, I suppose. Not quite exactly. sure. How. 
Well, the only bitterness is that he didn't get more money that he deserved. I mean, in the end, his passport still had Labour on it, you know, after all these years. And for an intelligent man, you know, in the end, a well-read man and an incredibly hard-working man, intelligent man, uh, yeah, he was always looked at over for any promotions. And any young kid who wasn't Catholic to come in, was, at the time, we just call it Protestant at the time, they, they would just get moved up. And... You know, that, that goes back a long way. Look what happened in Harlem and Wolf up in, you know, Northern Ireland, it said Belfast. It, it existed in that time. Mm. And it was Glasgow was like that. Certainly Belfast was like that. And it was part of what the culture you grew up on. And there was two ways to deal with it. You could get up and fight and argue and end up getting sacked, which he could, A, or couldn't afford to do. But B, his attitude was always with us. Do the best you can do. Be the mm. best you can be. And show people the correct way to behave. Uh, and in the end, after years, I mean, and it's easy to say after years, those years were long, you know, he was definitely respected by everyone in there. And he was then, the go to him asking for advice and things. And there was one classic one. Uh, and again, I finished this book quite a while ago. <laughs> so I can't remember all the bits I put in, but there was one, I remember him telling me a story once that when he first went in, he was in there a couple of years, and my dad had been a boxer. And he uh, They'd said to him, right, shovel all that coal. There was about two tons of coal there. And it was just to basically show him that they were boss and he was going to get the rubbish jobs. And he went, yep, no problem. And he shoveled it all, thinking to himself, this is great training. <laughs> this is really helping my yeah. uppercut. You know, and the attitude of, look, bad things happen. Worst things that happen to other people in the world. You make the best of what you've got yes. and for where you are. And uh, that's what he does. And he never, he wasn't a preacher to us, never preached to us. He just lived that life, and we have to choose whether to live that type that type of life like him. And I think we all did. Well, that, well, that, anyway. but, but that's you. I mean, you are the antithesis of "woe is me" or feeling sorry for myself or glass half empty. I mean, you can you I, listen to you talk about them both. There, you couldn't but have been that way. I mean, could you imagine if you were a "woe is me" type having those parents? It, it's impossible. Um, yeah, but I don't think so. If you were, if you looked at mad and like I admired them, I mean. I mean, I didn't go through a kind of too much of my angsty phase as a teenager. Maybe other members of the family might get a bit fed up sometimes and there have been bits of rebellion, and that's normal. You should have that as you grow up. Um, but when you get right down to it and you mature and you've had you know, good things like that passed down, um, it was brilliant. And again, they're never being forced. I mean, all the way through my life. Um, I mean, I was learning from my dad long, long after he left us. Um, Set my daughter, which we've talked about before, very, very talented badminton player. I was never a pushy parent, mm. but I was, I was damn supportive, you know, mm. there when you need me all the time and try and make her get the joy out of whatever she was doing. Um, so you, maybe you say you couldn't be like that. So certainly my brother Tommy, uh, very similar, Michael, Mary, very similar. My younger brother and sister probably had that wee bit harder than us because, you know, it's always a bit harder for the younger ones. Um, but we've all had this kind of attitude that... If you seem to be too self-indulgent, we won't even moan at you. We'll just look at you and go, yeah, I can do better than that. <laughs> uh, one last point, and look, there's so much in your youth I'd love to even talk about more, mm. but um, um, it jumped out to me, uh, the um, emphasis on education and, and all this mm. kind of stuff, but the emphasis on fitness really jumped out as well. So like your five brothers and sisters, you said in the book, you would go off for big, long hikes, six, seven, mm. eight hour hikes, partly mm. probably because it was so bloody cheap, but there was yep. just a throwaway line. And I'm somebody like, I feel the cold in the water. Yeah. You said we would swim in the open water for hours. Now yeah. I thought that's artistic license. I thought nobody is swimming <laughs> in, in the open water for hours, but so uh, you, you don't use your words. Uh, you don't use your words kind of lightly either. That's yeah. you just can't get around this. It so was don't... extraordinary. Yeah. <laughs> uh, generally at Trun, uh, which is obviously the coast. If you keep on swimming from Trun, you come to Ireland, right? Yeah. Um, via Arran. Um, but it was just the thing we did, and we were fanatical fitness people, but they would go out for a swim. The thing is with swimming, if you're an open, open water swimmer, you get to know, I hey, we wouldn't do it in December, man, but you know, during the summertime, just get in the water and swim, and, yeah. and it's swim straight out for an hour or two, and then swim back, <laughs> and you'd be like three or four of us, and my dad was a good swimmer, and there's another great story about my dad, he lost a kidney when he was young, um, through an illness. And they told him he'd never be be able to stay fit. Mm. And then one day when he's mid twenties, he just said, "I'm not having this." And he went into the water and swam, and yeah. he, he nearly died. And he got back out, 
And it, it was fun enough because after that, he was fine. Yeah. So he, he just didn't want to live a life where he couldn't live like that. But the brothers and sisters, we were all exactly like And they're, they're the same now. If I talk to my brother Tommy now, we'll talk about him running up hills in Hong Kong, you know, and all that sort of stuff. We, wherever we go, yeah. we do that sort of thing. And it's always stayed with us. And now it's a, hey, it's a normal thing now. Well, People love open water swimming now. Sure, but bring in like the whole posse out for a two-hour swim. I'm not sure that many families are doing that. Um, there's a lovely moment all the way through your youth. He reckons you'll play for Scotland one day. He's a big believer in your talent, less so than you, I think. And you go on yeah. to do that. And you describe when you make your debut and afterwards you meet him and you've got the jersey in a plastic bag and it's like Glaswegian, Irish. Let's keep emotion at bay. No pomp, yeah. no, cer <laughs> no ceremony. Here's, here, you better look after that. And you kind of toss him the jersey. Um, and I think a lot of people can relate to that way of how we talk to those that we love so much. Do you regret that in any way? Do you wish you had, had at a moment like that said to him, I love you so much. Thank you for all you've done. And, and I want you to have this and, and, you know, tears and all that kind of stuff. Do you feel like that's important? No, <laughs> not in the slightest. Um, you, you show what you really feel of people by how you act. That's it. Full stop. And me giving him that jersey, uh, I know it meant a lot to him. Um, and for us, it was like, we weren't trying to be cool or anything. You, you show your, your, your feelings for someone by the way you treat them. Mm. And, and that was exactly what we were doing on that occasion. And of course, the, the other time, I'm sure we've talked about it before, when we get beat by Ireland and he's sitting there smiling at the end of the game. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going, you're supporting them. <laughs> and I was playing for Scotland and Lawrence, who, Matt Lawrence had just scored against it. Um, and but there's a kind of unspoken. It, it didn't need to. It never had to be spoken. Mm. Um, but so just to finish it off for you, man. I had a brilliant last ten years with my dad because uh, I was working in Glasgow a lot, and I'd spend every evening with him. And we, I got to find out all the things I wanted to know. I, we had every conversation we were supposed to have. Mm. Um, but the last night, um, he got ill. He was he was a great night. I mean, the day before he was dancing, it was a great night. And uh, just in the hospital and. I went up to see him and they were going to do an operation in the morning. And I, I was like, oh, I'll see you in the morning, Dad. He'd been in a couple of times. Uh, he was, he was well into his 80s by this point. And uh, I went to walk out. And I, no, I need to go back. And I walked back. And then I walked out again. I got left down at the hospital. I thought, no, I need to go back. And I went back. I'd never done it like this before. And uh, anyway, the operation didn't work and uh, went badly wrong. And uh, you never woke up again. But it was this moment of, incredibly sad that we'd lost him but he'd left so much with us mm -hmm. with all of us that we knew that we had to carry on being the type of person he was and he'd had a brilliant life and uh well i'm, I'm not going to violence out yet but um he left a note for us all oh my god <laughs> wow. and that was the one time in his entire life that that emotion happened he left us a note i still can't read all the way through it so the motion was there, but it was only written down at the end. But we knew anyway. Yes, of course. Yeah, God, that's lovely. Um, yes. By the way, I'm, I'm really happy you've gone through my childhood uh, and not mentioned the star of the show. Anybody else who's talked so about my dog. The dog. Yeah. <laughs> the, dog was, the dog who went to mass every day. <laughs> yes, found his way home from all sorts of places. Shock horror, yeah. the Nevin dog was super smart as well. It, it was. It was <laughs> stupidly intelligent. Camille, so you, you feel things then very deeply, and I think that's expressed in your football and it's expressed in your relationship with music. And and that so that is the great theme of the book, I think, in so many ways. Um, I watched a lot of you on YouTube today playing football. And I have to confess, I don't know why I hadn't done that more, given all the Mondays we've talked. I mean, holy moly, the things you did were beautiful on the pitch. And my favorite thing you do that I saw, and I, I hate that I so much of your career isn't televised and caught on camera, because based on like the, the 15 minutes on YouTube I watched today, I found myself thinking, oh, man, I've missed a lot of amazing things he's done. The, the kind of sweetest thing you do, though, is either after scoring a goal or even after a brilliant assist on your part, and it, it, it makes you look like a boy out there, is you jump in the air and you put your two hands in the air and you arch your back and it's like you're bursting. It's like you're exploding. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's it's the most kind of joyous. It's just like out of control kind of thing. Yeah. Um, it's because well, I was yeah, just going to say, pe people think you're not passionate about football because the accidental yeah. footballer and you could take or leave a lot of the stuff. But man, the actual game, the game yeah, itself. The, I mean, you're, you're, you're head over heels in love. Yeah, the, the purity and the love of 
the actual playing, the, the scoring or creativity. I'm happy you said about the creativity because I say that to some people. I enjoy just making a goal as much as anything. Yeah. And they go, yeah. No. I'm thinking, well, have a look at <laughs> what it was like because the joy of that, because it's a team thing as well. Mm. It's not utterly selfish. And the first thing you want to do is go and celebrate with the guy who helped you make it or whatever and with the fans. Um, but that pure joy of you know all the, it's not even work, but everything you put the time in for, everything coming together is, is a brilliant, brilliant thing. Mm. I have, but oddly enough, I didn't think about celebrations. I can't remember them, but then you see them, they all look dead similar. And in the book, I know you've got an early copy. In the book, there's, there's three different celebrations you see. They're all the same. They're like that exact picture yeah. you painted is exactly it. And you don't think of it. Um, but I mean, it's, the, I hope that the joy of it comes through in the book. The, the absolute love and joy of playing football, of being involved in it, um, mm, of, does, yeah. you know, that winning is great. And that was the thing that confused a lot of people because it's all about you've got to win, you've got to win. And we've got this concept of you have to be one dimensional, you have to face one way, you have to do winning and everything else is secondary. And I think you lose a lot by being that way. Mm. I think you can be just as successful doing it in an artistic way, which is not just doing it for flair and flounce, but you know, doing it in a way that is actually good to watch as well. Yeah. So when there was a goal scored, I mean, I remember a particular one uh, I made for David Speed, yeah, the ball was hitting too well, and I scooped the entire defence, who's gone and rushed me. And uh, and I'm just thinking, yeah, I've just been an entire defence for one move there. I'm really yeah. happy. Then I need to beat the goalkeeper, this weird header thing, and still get the cross in. And at the end of it, I'm just happy with the beauty of it. Yeah. Yeah, we got a goal at the end. That's pretty good too. Um, so trying to get that kind of feeling of, and do you know this sounds a bit airy fairy? There's a lot of thinking beginning to come out of America now. They're saying, you've got to do this. You've got to live for the joy of it because you will be better. And it's quite modern thinking. And think of the Americans, that's not the way they think. Yes. There's a lot of new thinking about it now. And I'm reading a lot of this just now, thinking, yeah, I thought that 35 years ago. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it comes across in your play. That goal is on YouTube, by the way, where you scoop it over the entire defence. It's so funny that yeah. I've got, there's, if you ever get a chance, anyone's listening, uh, there's a piece up that's called Pat Nevin Skills. If you click onto that, there's about six or seven minutes worth, right? Of, yeah. A lot of scoop goals and things like that. Um, and that's probably about 5,000 watches or something. And then if you look at me missing a penalty, there's about half a million. And yeah. I think that's classic. And I don't get bitter about that. I think that's hilariously <laughs> funny. <laughs> Uh, so to give people the bare facts, because we're not going to get through everything here. So no. Clyde is where you started in Scotland, 1981 to 83. Yeah. And I mean, the 30 quid a week while you were in university seemed like, OK, I'll do that. And yeah. you win like players, player of the year in the Scottish second division. You turn down Chelsea initially and then eventually you go. So it's Chelsea for five years, 83 to 88. Yeah. Then it's Everton, 88 to 92. Tranmere, 92 to 97, which I know you thoroughly enjoyed, even though it's oh, kind of like forgotten. And then you retired in 2000. Uh, 28 Scottish caps between 86 and 96, five goals, probably double the number of assists. Mm -hmm. And 1982, European champion with the Scottish under-18s, player of the tournament yeah. in that. There is a theme, by the way, in your book of winning, like I think in your five years at Chelsea, you're player of the year twice, you're mm -hmm. player of the tournament at the Scottish under-18s uh, Euro winning uh, championship. There is a theme in your book of winning player of the year and being totally gobsmacked to have won player of the year. And I'm kind yeah. of thinking... For a smart dude, he's not realizing just how good he is out there at times. Uh, honestly, it never ever occurred to me when I was doing it. I certainly remember when I got Player of the Year first time at Chelsea, I didn't know there was a Player of the Year because okay. <laughs> I was so busy just doing my job and then leaving it at the end of the day. You know, and it usually was the end of the day. I'd stay and do extra, um, but I wasn't pushing for anything. I wasn't trying to sell myself. I was just loving doing it. It was a nice little bonus, and it sounds odd now. It meant nothing really to me at the time because it's about the team it's about winning it's about what you're doing week to week mm. looking back now it's like great because you know Zola's won it and Hazard's won it and it sounds great now yeah. um but at the time yeah very good um I'm, I'm with my girlfriend here you know because <laughs> got more important things to sort out um so that you know it's just not allowing and it's back to the, the family thing don't get too involved with yourself don't get too self-indulgent you know mm. remember you're part of a group Mm. And that's why there's this strange dichotomy, many dichotomies in the book and in life. And one of them is I was very much an individual type of player, but I was an utter team player as well. Mm. And people always at that time thought, 
you had to be either one or the other. And I thought that was stupid to, to think you should be either one or the other. It's perfectly reasonable to be both. Yes. Um, and you see that a lot now. Uh, the book is full of just brilliant stories. So funny. And I, we won't get time to go through them all and you don't want to give them all away anyway. But say, <laughs> for instance, for instance, to give one, which I just thought this is, I just, it's just so funny. Uh, Pat's arrived at Chelsea. He's done very well. Players, player of the season, all that kind of stuff. They've won promotion and it's time to negotiate with Ken Bates. And like, you're not even sure if you want to be a footballer. I mean, you, you, you're you still like, kind of like my yeah. mates in college. I mean, this is fun and everything, but I'm not sold on the whole idea even just yeah. yet. So you you do a bit of research and you write down your terms and it's like two years, no more than two years. It's yeah. like 450 quid a week. I want my five return flights to Scotland, 20% increase if I become an international player. So on, you've done your research. Yeah. Bates storms out of the room, trying to intimidate a young kid as if what he's read here is an aberration. This is a disgrace. Yeah. Bates storm Ken Bates storms out of the room, gets in his car, drives off. You're alone in his office. You can take yeah. it over. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so I knew that I was being bullied, that he was attempting to bully me. Yeah. And I just thought, what? Uh, I'm not having that because I have nothing to lose because I can walk back up the road and he has got something to lose because I'm an asset to him. And I thought, okay, okay if you're going to play by those rules, I'm playing by those rules. So I did what anyone from the East End of Glasgow would do. And I, <laughs> I rifled through his drawers and I found all the contracts and I'd done a mean, median and mode average of them that night. And come back in the next day and asked for more because <laughs> it wasn't the average, not a lot more. And he was furious. And he, just, he just about blew his top. And I've got this thing where when I get people angry like that, I can't, it makes me laugh. <laughs> and he's looking at me and he's seeing me laughing. And this is not the correct way because Bates is quite a big character, he's a strong character. And he, again, trying to bully. And he just couldn't get me. He just couldn't get through at all. In fact, he writes in one of his books early on. I have no idea where that guy's coming from at yeah. all, right? And uh, when I told, he said to him, how, how are you asking for that? And I said, well, it's just the average. He goes, you don't know what the average is. And I went, yeah, I do. I rifled through your drawers last night when you left. <laughs> and he couldn't believe it. He just looked at me and went, brilliant. <laughs> killed himself laughing. And it could have gone another way, but the problem is the other way had no negative impact on me either. And I'd figured this out, yeah. you know, quite obviously that, I was holding a lot more aces than he was at that point yeah. in time. There, so, was, there was almost a game respects game quality to his reaction when you told yeah. him. He was like, oh, okay, I can kind of respect that. <laughs> um, there's loads more I want to talk to you about. We're going to take a very short break. We're talking to Pat Nevin about his memoir, The Accidental Footballer, back in one sec. Now, you're very welcome back. We're talking to Pat Nevin about his new memoir, The Accidental Footballer, available in all good bookstores and online now, and an audiobook. One of the dudes I play golf with, by the way, was listening to an audiobook, so uh, he was enjoying that. He could understand uh, you as well. You're good, brilliant. good. That, that's the important thing. You know I, I worry about that <laughs> when I was asked to do the audible book. They call it audible book. I don't know why. Right. I always call it audio book, but uh, that's what they call it now. And uh, they, when they told me they were going to do it, and, and I said, who are you going to get to read it? <laughs> said me I went what but actually it turns out it was, it's a good thing to do yeah. and the reaction to that they've told me they're stunned by the sales of that and well, uh, but yeah I mean it's it's amazing all this previously wasted time doing the ironing doing the dishes in the car is now a uh, very useful yeah. time I mean I'm, I'm all over them myself um this is just apropos of nothing. One of the stories that sort of stayed with me and you can describe it is Pearl Norman Whiteside age 26 having mm. to retire you might take it up where you, and again, this is just um, where Pat the Oddball is kind of a thing. You and your brother-in-law after training, and you're kind of almost unique in this. You do stuff after training to get better. You know, shock horror, what a thought. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you would both be in goal firing shots at each other, and you're diving around in the mud. Um, God, it's a, it's a very striking scene that you paint then. Yeah. I mean, anyone who loves football growing as a kid, you've put a set of goals out 30 yards away from each other. And you've just played shots yeah. at each other. Yeah, you dive about, save it, he dives about. But I'm playing for Everton. And I've got this most beautiful grass place to, to play on. We've put the goals up. I've got Neville Southall's gloves on, everything. We're down about with loonies. It's bucketing down with rain, which makes it even more fun because you can dive and it's you're sliding across, etc. So um, we play in this, and it's probably 20 odd goals each. And my brother in law is a good lad, and mm. he was a student in Liverpool at the time. And then just suddenly, out of nowhere, I caught my eye. I saw somebody under the trees at the side at Belfield. And it was Norman Whiteside. And he'd just been told he had to retire uh, that day. 
And I, I was like, looked over and I knew he, because I was obviously the union and I was helping doing the deal to the insurance and all that. And he, he had the look of, I would do anything mm. to be doing what you're doing just now. And it was that moment of, we were, we were joyous kids diving about. I know what, hey, I was 24, 25 at the time, but we were joyous kids having a brilliant time. And then it was just, oh, that was so desperately sad at that point in time to see that. Mm. And for Norman being such a great player, I talk a lot about Norman in the book. There are other people I could have talked about. I just chose people who I found were interesting. On um, Chelsea, and even to an extent then Everton, I did. I know you. I know you do have a glass half full approach. But with yeah. Chelsea, initially it was going so well, and you're allowed to express yourself, and the team are doing interesting things and playing football in a more progressive way than they could have yeah. been. And John Neal, the coach, is great for you. Yeah. And suddenly then there's a regime change at Chelsea, and you, you like of all players, you know, for any younger listeners like think I know you I know you feel a kinship with David Silva you yeah. that type of player you are being told literally at a certain point as Chelsea player if you take more than two touches at a time before hoofing it into the penalty box mm. you will be subbed yeah. and I like put a dagger in my heart you know yeah. that that so that it's such a pity isn't it do you do you feel whatever about the money and all the nice stuff do you look at the current I know you get asked this all the time, but do you mm. look at the, the pitches nowadays and the style of play nowadays? You must just think, Ugh, a lot of good aspects to when I played, but man, the actual game would have suited me mm. more now. No, it would have suited me more now. The problem is, if you say, people often ask you, oh, you wouldn't have survived in the modern game. And you can't say, oh, yes, I would have, because you mm. sound like a sad old git. Yeah. So, but what you say is, uh, what I understand is, look, there are certain parts of my game that would be much, much, much more suited. In fact, my whole game would have been much more suited to the modern game. And certainly the pitches would have been a help as well. The fact that you weren't assaulted every 20 minutes or maybe even less than that. Mm. Um, so the, the, all those sides of it. Uh, people say, ah, oh, but it's faster now and there's, you know, they, they run more. And I'm thinking, excuse me, I was a, I was a competitive distance runner. Yeah. I can run like that. I can run with the best of them. You, you'll do well if you stick with me. So bit of that gets you, it could get you down, but I don't really care about it. You have your time. You enjoy your time. You do, do the best in your time. Yes. If you walk about in any part of your life saying, oh, I wish I had this, that, and the next thing, you just walk about fed up. It's just yes. enjoy it and make the best of what you have. And that's exactly the attitude I have. It. And that's why I do love watching these players now. Hmm. I'm not jealous of them. I love the joy some of them are having out of it. And at Everton, it was a very, I mean, it was a fascinating passage on Everton. You know, one of the top teams in the country had won the league not so long ago. Uh, Merseyside is really dominant for obvious reasons with Liverpool as well. There was, without kind of oversimplifying the situation, there was the older players, the successful mm -hmm. players, and then you were amongst a batch of mm -hmm. either potential replacements for them, yeah. which is a weird dynamic yeah. anyway, or else they just didn't quite rate you. And that was a, a divided dressing room and that was the real I suppose pity of your time at Everton Everton fans might be interested to hear yeah um, I've talked to a few Everton fans already who have read, read the book and they're really interested in it because that kind of story has been written before from a couple of angles uh, I know Sharpie's written a book TC Tony Cotty's written a book There's, I'm not taking any sides I'm telling you what I saw happening mm -hmm. and I'm not on anybody's side here I'm saying this is why this happened. This is why that team did not fulfill its potential because it was a far better group of players. And I'm not digging anybody out because that's, that's dull. I've, no, it's not dull. We've read that before in a million different books and that sells books. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in telling you what really happened. And I'll not insult your intelligence by trying to sort of rope people in for a big headline. I'm just going to tell you, this is exactly what it felt like inside at the time. Mm. The frustration of it, the upset of it. And, you know, even people, you know, Howard Kendall at the moment, him, Howard and I didn't want at all. And I absolutely wasn't one of those type of people. But I'll tell you, if you read the book, it doesn't sound as if I've hammered them. I've just been honest and told yeah. you, you know, what it was like and the reasons why things happen. Um, and funny enough, I've not had a negative word from an, Ever an Evertonian. They've went, yeah, that's obvious now. It's not easy to see it from the outside. And since then, they've also had two different versions of it, you know, from either side of this schism within mm. the team. Um, but to see someone who's invested, but not on a side, I, I hope that gives them more balance for you. That's no, it what does. I'm trying to do. It does. And someone cracked a gag at the time that there were, you know, this dressing room split in two, and then they go, actually, it's split in three. 
there's you two sides and then there's Pat and you took this yeah. big compliment and I can see why. Um, that was that was by the way that was Colin Harvey. Colin Harvey, yeah. Whose, whose daughter sent me a book two days ago and I sent it back uh, yesterday uh, with a big message to Colin on it and it's that's one of the joys of writing a book like this. Mm. I can actually say to, to a number of very important people in my life here. I hope you like this and I hope it tells you something about things that will happen at a time that you might not have known. And mm. it was a joy to, but I've not heard from Colin yet, so we'll see what he thinks of it. He's been <laughs> unwell recently and apparently okay. he's recovering now, so which is great news. Okay, good. Um, I've, I've kind of glossed by the music then. I mean, we're, we're, we're struggling to touch even all the football. Yeah. Uh, what struck me, so like you don't need to explain why you like music uh, is not the way I want to do this, but you do describe, for instance, going to uh, Jerusalem Column performance and being so moved by it and so emotional that you still have tears in your eyes mm. the next day at training so that is a that is a deep level of engagement with music what try and in so much as you can as you could with football try and explain that relationship I, that you have I've, I've tried lots of times to understand it uh, but it takes i'm not massively religious you know i'm, I'm quite um I'll, I'll take the christian ethic i love the passion as you can probably tell um, but something needs to touch the soul. And I don't think you get a choice. I think something does, and whatever it is, it touches you. Mm. And many things do. I mean, I, 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 mean, I love dance. You know, I like the ballet. There's some quite funny ballet stories, and <laughs> I'm sure you'll agree. Mm -hmm. um, and, and lots of other things. But the music, it can always, it'll always get to you. And sometimes it's unexpected. Um, but it's just been a pure love of my life, you know, all the way through my life. Now, it's, I'm not a snob about it. Uh, have unusual musical tastes. I think people would probably accept, um, but I, I kind of just want to share them. I want mm. to say, look, this is so beautiful. You, you've not heard this. This is so wild. You've not heard this. This is so different. You've not heard this. And people who are really into music of that ilk will always, always share it. And it's a, it's a brilliant, brilliant thing. You meet great friends through it. Um, yes. It's, it's been, an, and also when I'm thinking about it in reality, and then you've probably touched a wee nerve here, but I, I needed something to get me away from football because football would have taken over everything and I couldn't allow it to do it because I wanted to be a rounded human being so I wanted to read I wanted to do other things but the music always just was that little bit different that little bit special and um, there are moments where you're emotionally moved I'm emotionally moved by music and, and, and everybody is of course and lots of people are and by the way it doesn't matter if it's Dua Lipa or Duretti Column Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a good line. I should have used that. <laughs> um, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Um, and my son and my daughter are fanatical musicians, but I'm musically, but they won't listen to the same stuff as I listen. Sure. It's not important. Yes. And when you listen to music, do you uh, daydream and does it take you to places where you imagine uh, events that have happened or events that you just uh, invent in your head? Or are you concentrating on the music and the texture and the beats and the, the, the technique behind it, or is it very casual? Mm. What, so when, when wash, do you like to go over. places? It's what? wash over. It's wash just over. to wash over you. So you're not like, thinking you too hard. Listening. Yeah. Yeah. I, when I was younger, I used to, I mean, if you were into prog rock and all this, that when you're younger, yeah. you would listen to all the lyrics and all that sort of stuff. And who's doing guitar and is he using a nylon guitar, all that sort of stuff. And then it kind of takes away the magic a wee bit. So okay. I, I stopped doing that really. And I just, let it wash and i love the fact that some things i can't tell you we were talking recently about my new the last one is a band from galway that i found new dad who i love right, right. And i really don't want to know why i love it but i just love it and if okay. i i could go and dig into it and say right there's a little bit of my bloody valentine there they've had a bit of this there and and fine but no the whole thing works as a piece of art and sometimes you don't know why and if you go to the louvre and you see a work of art you, you kind of don't really know why, yes. it, but it hits you and it washes over you. And I, there's nothing wrong with actually saying that, except if you're a football and try and say that, we used to slap you. <laughs> I, know, I know. And and just to give people a sense of how like immersed in, th this is in your life. So like I, we mentioned Judy Collin there and like there's an episodic quality to your existence, which mm -hmm. I kind of admire and I'm envious of. But, you know, to connect the dots, you become friends with Vinnie Riley from yeah. Judy Collin yeah. and... He brings you around Morrissey's gaff house yeah. and, and you get Morrissey to give you a tour of the house, including his gym, which is unexpected. You know, so <laughs> like it's there the whole time. And, and of course, John Peel cannot be 
not mentioned in this conversation who becomes mm-hmm. such a he's a hero of yours initially becomes such a great friend of yours mm-hmm. and you know god you describe it just sounds magic playing for chelsea in the 80s and you'll go and hang out with john peel as he presents his show mm-hmm. and the understanding is that he won't ever name you but occasionally yes. he'll he'll tell the listeners by the way i have the famous footballer in with me tonight <laughs> and, and of course nobody thought, knows yeah 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 i just thought wow that's amazing amazing stuff it, it, it does for a lot of people but the football players wouldn't have known who john peel was right and many people wouldn't have known a lot about john because it was late night radio and it was just people who are massively into music who would have mm. known john mm. so people of of my kind of subculture it was absolutely living the ultimate dream and in retrospect for for people, oh, that must have been amazing. Yeah, it was amazing for me. Yeah, I absolutely loved it. But for a lot of other people, it was a bit low, lo-fi. You know, because if you're Charlie Nicholas, you, you actually want to be with the page three girl in the fl- swanky nightclub in London. Yeah. That's where you want to be. And I don't want to be there. You know, I've, I've got a girlfriend. I'm hanging about with Peely. I'm going to gigs. That's, that is the dream life. And I'm happy you say it sounds like a real dream life because it did feel like mm. that to me. But from everyone else, it just looked very lo-fi. I was wearing scruffy clothes. You know, I'd get clothes at Oxfam. They would be buying really expensive clothes. But I was incredibly happy. And mm. I, and again, I think it goes back to the first thing we talked about today. They thought I was a weirdo. And I'm thinking, no, no, I think I've got this right. Mm. <laughs> I think I'm living mm. a life that's really good fun enjoyable i'm not taken too seriously and i'm yeah. getting some amazing adventures out of it and um, and that's kind of why in retrospect uh, the people have got in touch with us um because i'm I, you know i don't do a lot of twitter but twitter has been absolutely beautiful it's been unbelievable yes. uh the people have got in touch it's been fabulous I put, I put your name into Twitter just out of interest to see how, how the book was doing and like your approval rating on Twitter is off the charts. I mean, it's, uh, it's, uh, with, with, nobody, with, with nobody's that exception. popular on Twitter. <laughs> no, with one exception, there's okay. one group that they hate me with a passion and, and actually I'm okay with that. I'm, again, I'm actually all right with that because you, you, you're not going out to want people to love you. Yeah. You're just sharing who you are and some people just won't like it, won't get it. And you know, fair enough. It's okay. I'm kind of cool with it. It won't stop me being what I am. Um, and of course, there always is a backlash. <laughs> so when part two comes out, there'll no doubt be a back- backlash. But it's been lovely, and people have said things, you know, that you know reacted to. I remember that day and how I felt, and you made it easier for me because you were a bit different. And that mm. allowed me to be a bit different. Um, there's another story in the book about um, even to this day, I, I do meet black guys in London who always nod to me. So there's little echoes that still filter through the time and they're, they're, they're brilliant they're beautiful and I'm absolutely blessed to have them yeah. um, but in the midst of it all, I, never, I don't want this to sound too earnest because I'm not you know as you know very well I'm not except when the, the moment needs it um, but every one of those stories you said it's really interesting you say that because my favourite thing about the whole book experience is everyone that's talked to me about it has brought up a different subject nobody's yeah. asked me the same things and if, if we were speaking for the first time, like I would have gone straight to the Paul Cannaville mm. abuse, uh, which you mentioned, which is why, you know, black guys of a certain age will give you a nod these days because mm. they know, I mean, after that game at Sellers Park, you came out and you didn't want to speak about the game. And you said, we're talking about the racism. And the next game you walked out with Paul and you'd carry Dix on the other side and he got cheered by the fans. Mm. And I think you met with some National Front dudes for a chat and yeah. an exchange of views. That was fun. <laughs> yeah, I know. And we've talked about that before. And so I, if I hadn't talked to you before, I'd go straight to that because that's an amazingly kind of striking moment in, in football. I guess if I had to sum up kind of, and there's a certain jealousy in my part because I don't live my life uh, this way enough, but reading your book kind of, it hit home to me the advantages of, of your approach, which is you will... And like, this is how you end up in some mad places, like sleeping on a bench after going to the Hacienda overnight at the train station or like- After scoring the window the night before on the BBC television, yeah. Yes, I know, like insane stuff or, you know, you're nearly killed by a Spurs fan on the mm-hmm. tube or, you know, yeah. I mean, it doesn't speak well of football, but you're like the only one of the team interested to go and see the Great Wall of China or Tiananmen yeah. Square, you know. Yeah. But, but throughout, um, and I think it's the reason maybe it is a bit episodic, your life attitude seems to be that you are very genuinely curious about the world, curious about other people. And 
it would seem you never neglect the opportunity to go somewhere and see something. Mm. Let's find out what happens. And you never know what's out there. And as a result, you seem to have had all these like mini adventures. Mm. Um, yes. Uh, I hate when you particularly nail me, which you have there. <laughs> That's the massive, massive part of my personality. Yeah. And the reason, I've got lots of reasons why I wrote this book. And one of the reasons was, as I travelled around the world after my football career, I did that. I kept on doing it. And I collected all these weird stories as I, I went along. Mm. So the initial idea for the book was to get rid of the football stuff really early and just tell these other stories. I never got to them. I never reached. <laughs> so sadly, that's part three. <laughs> okay. and, and I've done all, and it's, that's already planned out. Who knows if I'll ever see the light of day, I'll write it, but who, see, who knows if it'll get produced. But I will do that to this day. And I will, when I was over in, for the European Champions, the, the Champions League final there, I'm not mm. going to sit in the bar and I'm not going to sit in the hotel. I'm going to go out and do things and I'm going to have an adventure and see mm. places and see people in unusual positions and just learn and find out things and be open-minded, you know, and travel does that to you. And right just now, we're all stuffed at the moment, but it won't be forever. Um, and I do urge anyone, you know, when it's safe, go out and look and don't do all the same things. Because if you go to a beach and you sit on the beach or whatever and you know go to a restaurant that night and then do that for 14 nights in a row then come home and then do that every year every one of those holidays will blur into one mm. i promise you right see if you don't see if you go out and do things and find things and go to different places and meet people and be open they won't you'll see different things you'll remember different things you will find stories be a one with the world and it's it's, it's a it's been the actual story that i've wanted to to some degree, I've not been able to do it as much as I wanted in my life because I wanted to do it with my wife. And it's been difficult with, you know, with, with bringing up the children, but I've done it through my actual job I've done. So it's been brilliant doing that, but it just so happens I do the job that allows that to happen mm. all mm. the time. I mean, it's a classic example, very, very quick. There's a guy called John McNaught who turns up in the book. Um, and he's, he's just a non, not a very well-known player at all at Chelsea. But there's as much written about him as maybe many other people in the book that are very famous names. But it was just, I stopped and listened to John. And I and do that because you'll find interesting people. And mm. I, the reason why we do this show, I come on the show and chat to you all the time. And I've said it to you before, I, I am interested in talking to people who will listen, who would go and direct conversations other ways. I've got lost a number of other people who want me to work for them. I, I'll do it twice and think, right, well, okay, well, you're doing it by numbers and I'm, it doesn't interest me, you know. But I've come in this and I've been doing this for many years and before mm. your time, etc. But it's always been the same from day one. It's questioning, it's questioning, it's asking the difference, it's pushing the envelope. That's why, and I do say, I'm not just saying because I'm, I've said this to you before, it's different in Ireland. And that's why, and it's probably it's something deep inside, you know, my history that we have, we share this. And there's one, one other thing, I have too many things to say. But <laughs> this one other thing, it's been a joy doing that. Mm. Part of the reason I'm doing the book, the way I did it, and you might notice there's a, there's a skeleton of football. Football's a skeleton, right? And I had to think of a technical way of getting the book. And all the stories are kind of off it. But some of them are jump off into the notes. Now, you'll notice the notes are quite long. Mm. But I wanted to use them because we Celts, what we do is, we jump off into another story and jump back on, jump in another story and back on. But you need to keep that scale on. And I have found this way of doing it. And that's, that allowed me to actually get the book looking and sounding the way I wanted it to do. Because that's what we do in these shows. That's we jump off. I, I was wondering what that was. The like seriously long footnote things at the bottom. But geez, it, it's a great device. It works brilliantly. Yeah, yeah I really I, I still can, can I admit that I stole it completely? Because I would never have used that because my history of... Great writers don't use notes. They, they, they envelop everything in the story. But in actual fact, I, I, wrote, I read Adam Kay's book about four years ago. Okay. And it's one of the funniest books I've ever read in my life. And uh, he just used these long notes. And I thought, I'm not going to be a snob about this. If this helps the reader, then I'm going to do it. And, I, and it's a great joy because you go and tell this encapsulated story and then jump back in again. It's yeah. great. I loved it. Well, listen, my man, I just thoroughly enjoyed this. I have to say it was um, it was such an interesting read and very heartfelt. And I could hear your voice in it, which is no surprise, given that you wrote the thing. Be bad if I couldn't <laughs> hear your voice in it. So I know it's selling really well in Ireland. I'm not surprised to hear. So, again, yeah. 
Pat Nevin, The Accidental Footballer, a memoir. Continued success, my man. Enjoy the Euros. I'm sure we'll chat to you over the course of it. So uh, as ever, that was a pleasure. Yeah. Didn't get to like half the stuff I wanted to get to. Ah, can you don't. There's a book there. You can read it in there. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again, Joe. So there you are. That was the great Pat Nevin. Football on off the ball with Paddy Power's Save Our Game, donating 10k to Irish football for every goal England score at the Euros. For information on responsible gambling, visit gamblingcare.ie.